Good afternoon to all. First of all, I'd like to thank ISN Southern Chapter for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, today, I'd like to present our study, The Efficacy and Safety of Standard versus High-Dose Bicarbonate Supplementation in Chronic Kidney Disease of Unknown Etiology, an open-label randomized controlled trial. So, metabolic acidosis, as we all know, is a, a, a most common complication of chronic kidney disease, and it has implications on CKD progression and uh, reduction in bone mineral density, loss of muscle mass, and all-cause mortality. So bicarbonate supplementation is a simple measure. And what we already know about bicarbonate supplementation is uh, it can lead to a, uh, around 50% reduction in ESRD rates. And all the uh, bodies, all the professional bodies has recommended correcting bicarbonate to a level of more than 22 milliequivalents to around 24 milliequivalents per liter. But uh, upper limit, optimum limit, for uh, optimum uh, upper limit is actually uh, the data for op optimum upper limit is actually lacking. The observational data has shown that there is benefit uh, for up to around 28 to 32 milliequivalents per liter. Um, but majority of the RCTs have targeted above 22 to 20, uh, 24 milliequivalents. The data for uh, around 26 to 28 is still lacking. So the unanswered concerns include whether a higher bicarbonate level translates to better renal protection. If so, what is the safe upper limit? Whether bicarbonate supplementation aggravate hypertension and cardiac failure? Whether uh, it will alter renal hemodynamics? There are some animal studies that have shown that bicarbonate supplementation can affect the systemic vascular tone. And also the patient concerns. Well, will a higher pill burden uh, can stand in the way of a tolerability in the long term? And how will it matter in CKDU population, which is underrepresented in clinical trials, but India has a vast majority population, uh, CKDU population is there in India. So the aim of our study, the primary outcome was to compare the effect of two corrections, that is a high dose correction, 26 to 28 milliequivalents per liter versus a standard dose correction on EGFR stabilization in CKDU patients. And EGFR stabilization was defined as an EGFR decline of less than 1 ml over 3 months in CKDU, that is stages 3B, 4, and 5, who are not on dialysis. And the secondary outcome was to see for the effect of this correction uh, on urine albumin creatinine ratio, total peripheral vascular resistance, and to see for the tolerability, adherence, and safety of the intervention. So CKDU, there is no definite diagnostic criteria. We had used a criteria adapted from the Jayatilak et al and modified by the Dubai et al. It has three points. First is uh, no history of any identifiable uh, etiology for CKD, normal blood sugars, and absence of severe hypertension. If meeting all the criteria, it's a definite CKDU. And if it is meeting the criteria one and two, uh, then it is a possible CKDU. Moving on to materials and methods. So we, in order to capture more of the patients uh, from CKDU, so we had uh, included patients with 24-hour urine protein less than 1 gram per day at the time of diagnosis of CKD with EGFR of less than 45 ml per minute with a venous bicarbonate level of less than 22 milliequivalents per liter. And the patients were not on bicarbonate supplementation uh, one month prior to randomization. And the patients were under our follow-up for uh, around six months prior to randomization. And patients were having a stable EGFR. And we had excluded patients with the uh, underlying etiology like diabetes or systemic diseases or glomerular diseases, obstructive uropathies, a kidney transplant recipient, patient who received immunosuppression and acute kidney injury, and then uh, patients with uh, electrolyte abnormalities, and patients who were planned to be initiated on dialysis in the next six months. So the sample size calculation was based on a previous study that was done from our center. Uh, by the way at all, which included patients predominantly of uh, CKDU and uh, which corrected the uh, bicarbonate uh, to a level of 22 to 24. It has shown that there is a EGFR preservation uh, in up to 56.4 percentage of patients. So we had assumed that uh, the high dose correction may stabilize in an additional 25 percentage of patients also. So with an alpha error of 0 0.05 and a power of 80 percentage, adding an attrition of 10 percentage uh, on follow up the sample size was decided as 67. And uh, patients underwent block randomization with a varying block sizes of 4 and 6, uh, with allocation ratio of uh, 1 is to 1. And allocation concealment was done using sequentially numbered opaque sealed envelopes. So uh, 154 patients were screened uh, for the study. 
26 patients were excluded because of various reasons. 128 patients were, uh, were randomized and 64 were allocated into each arm. All patients were followed up and uh, they have underwent the uh, uh, intention to treat analysis at the end of the study. So this is the study protocol. Uh, after the patients were enrolled and randomized, they were randomized into two uh, groups, high dose and the low dose arm. At the entry, the patients underwent basic clinical examination, basic CKD workup investigations, including renal function test, electrolytes, and other investigations. And also, along with that, venous bicarbonate, uh, GFR estimation, spot urine albumin creatinine ratio, and uh, total peripheral resistance. And uh, uh, every monthly patients were on follow up. Uh, monthly, on monthly visits, we had assessed the adherence uh, for the uh, uh, intake of pills using pill counts, counting the uh, empty wrappers. And in between the monthly visits, we had called the patients over uh, telephone calls and uh, asked for any tolerability issues or any, uh, any um, for the pill count also. And bicarbonate levels were measured and the doses were titrated accordingly. And the same thing was done in the second month. And the third month, patients were exited from the study. At the time of exit, again, the venous bicarbonate, GFR estimation, spot urine albumin creatinine ratio, total peripheral resistance, and examination were done. And the initial bicarbonate dosing at the entry was based on a sliding scale. So this is a sliding scale for the initial bicarbonate dosing that we had used based on the baseline bicarbonate levels of the patient at the time of recruitment. And the compliance was defined as taking more than 80% of the prescribed dosage, and uh, that is based on the pill count uh, during each visit. So these are the investigations. These are the investigations which were done. That is a urine albumin excretion, which was done using microalbumin uh, turbidimetric procedure. And serum creatinine and urine creatinine were measured using Jaffe's kinetic method. And internal quality control was performed using material supplied by BioRad for the creatinine. Venous bicarbonate levels may be measured using a blood gas analyzer from Siemens. So this is a, a measurement of total peripheral resistance was done using an instrument called finometer. That's a non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring system. The statistical analysis, the categorical variables, uh, the primary uh, outcome were tested using Fisher exact and chi-square test. Continuous variable were tested using the independent uh, student t-test or man Whitney u test. And the changes in uh, bicarbonate levels over three months were tested using the two-way uh, repeated measures of ANOVA. And EGFR between the groups at the exit was compared using ANCOVA. Albumin creatinine ratio and systemic vascular resistance changes were uh, analyzed using a linear fixed model. An intention to treat analysis was used. And significant levels, uh, uh, level was considered to be 5 percentage and a p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered to be significant. So moving on to results, the baseline characteristics between the two arms were uh, similar. So the EGFR between the high dose arm and the standard dose arm were uh, similar. The bicarbonate level at the baseline in both the arms, in the high dose arm and the standard dose arm, it was lesser. In the high dose arm, it was 18.2 and the standard dose arm, it was 17.9. So this is the venous bicarbonate levels which we got over the three months. So the standard dose arm had a bicarbonate level of 17.9 to begin with and the high dose had a level of 18.2 which increased over three months to get the high dose arm it was 24.7 and standard dose arm it was 22.7 with a median dose of bicarbonate of 3 grams in the high dose arm and 2 grams in the standard dose arm. So other characteristics, it was found that the pH and the urine sodium excretion are similar between the high dose arm and the standard dose arm. But it was noted that there is, a, there is an increase in the urine sodium excretion when compared to the baseline in both the arms after uh, bicarbonate supplementation. So moving on to the primary and secondary endpoints, the primary endpoint is the preservation of EGFR. Uh, it, is, uh, it was seen that uh, around 56.3 patient percentage of patients in the high dose arm had preserved EGF, EGFR and 53.1 percentage of patients in the standard dose arm had preserved EGFR. There was no difference between the, there is no effect for bicarbonate supplementation on EGFR in short term. And another thing 
interesting thing, thing that was noted was there is there was a tendency to increase there was a tendency for the urine albumin creatinine ratio to increase with bicarbonate supplementation that is in the high dose arm it uh, came up from 53 to 96 and from standard dose arm it uh, came up from 66 to 77 and that was the, the trend was uh, over the three months was increasing and that was significant and it was also seen that the systemic vascular resistance for in the high dose arm and the standard dose arm there was a uh, reduction uh, but that was not that there was a tendency for reduction but that was not statistically significant so another thing is drug tolerability and adverse events uh, the overall serious adverse events were not there in both the arm but concerns for pill burden was more in the high dose arm uh, hypertension worsening of hypertension gi adverse effects or edema was not significantly seen in uh, was not significantly different in both of the uh, arms so uh, more than even though more than 90 percentage of the patients were compliant about only about 75 percentage of patients attained target bicarbonate con uh, concentration in the standard dose arm and only 25 percentage could attain bicarbonate levels more than 26 in the high dose arm so the hindrance for further increase in the dose was pill burden so why these patients did not attain the target bicarbonate levels that we had targeted because there was a lower baseline bicarbonate level so the patients who did not attain the levels and of course there was a higher pill burden so the maximum tolerated dose in high dose arm for the patients was 12 tablets that is 6 gram of sodium bicarbonate in the study we had capped at 16 tablets but patients could not tolerate more than 12 tablets then the exploratory endpoints the egfr creatinine and uh, rapid decline of egfr that was also similar between the high dose and the standard dose arm and it is in line with the previous study that is done in our center the strengths of the study the study has included patients uh, with ckdu with stable kidney function and we had assessed the compliance by assessing the pill counts and all the lab measurements were standardized and to the best of our understanding this is the first trial of alkali supplementation in patients with CKD, uh, ckdu so limitations it's an open label study a single center study uh, with a duration of three months and we had used generic bicarbonate 500 milligram with six milliequivalents of uh, bicarbonate so that was a hindrance for further increase in the dose escalation due to pill burden so there are not many studies uh, randomized studies which had kept a higher target level of around 26 to 28 these are the two studies the uba study and the base pilot study which had inclusion uh, the uba study had inclusion of uh, ckd stage 3 4 and 5 whereas base pilot had 3b 4 and 3a with albuminuria so they had kept a bicarbonate uh, target around 28 26 to 28 and their mean bicarbonate uh, baseline bicarbonate was in the uba study it was 21.5 and the base pilot study it was 25 but in the current study in our study the baseline bicarbonate is 18 and 17.9 uh, so uh, these studies with a mean by higher ba mean baseline bicarbonate also could not could attain a bicarbonate level post uh, intervention around 26 only so in the current study in our study also we could attain uh, 24.7 and 22.7 the outcome of those studies were doubling of serum creatinine, all-cause mortality, and uh, time to RRT uh, in UBA study. So that uh, was a positive study. The base pilot study has shown uh, there is no difference in any EGFR. And it has also shown that there was an increase in urine albumin creatinine ratio. Our study also showed there is no difference in EGFR or increase in urine albumin creatinine ratio. So data beyond 26 milliequivalents are lacking. So what we learned from the study is that a degree of metabolic acidosis uh, is significantly higher might be due to the preferential tubular interstitial involvement in CKDU so targeting a higher bicarbonate has not shown any protective effects on EGFR in short term there is a tendency of increase in urine albumin creatinine ratio in both arms uh, it is safe there are no serious adverse events high pill burden is an issue so uh, what are the new ideas that this study has put forth so the higher bicarbonate correction is feasible it is safe there are no safe adverse events 
pill burden is definitely a major concern for the patient and there is tendency for urine albumin creatinine ratio to increase so we can it, is, it may be prudent to include urine albumin creatinine ratio as a primary endpoint in later studies with a larger sample size also along with that uh, to detect a reduction in systemic vascular resistance and cardio protection of the uh, sodium bicarbonate supplementation and uh, the pH goals, whether we can keep pH goals uh, as an outcome uh, that also the study put forth. Sodium bicarbonate supplementation is a simple and easy tool for nephrologists. So if we can do further in this uh, thing, so it will be very much useful and a simple tool further. I would like to thank Department of Nephrology and my guide, Dr. Premvada, for this opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Swathi, uh, very good, uh, really concepted, uh, you know, co conceived study. Uh, two questions. One is, you chose the primary endpoint as less than one ml decline in GFR per month, correct? Yes. Uh, instead, could you have seen a different outcome or a different way of looking if you had just looked at the GFR per se, instead of taking less than one ml per minute as the endpoint, number one. And number two, uh, like Dr. Vishwasan mentioned, three month is a very short term for evaluating GFR. Even that small change may be a lab error also. So, I mean, that is one thing. And of course, uh, are you planning any follow-up on these patients? Yes, sir. The first question, actually, the, in uh, the previously one study was done in our center uh, for a duration of six months. Mm -hmm. Actually, that has shown that there is uh, a preservation of GFR for of around 2 ml per 2 ml over a period of six months duration. Okay. So that this we had uh, kept as a proof of concept study for mainly for safety. So uh, we are planning for a further uh, study Follow. with uh, EGFR and uh, ACR as a co-primary endpoint uh, for a longer duration. Sir. And as you have mentioned, obviously the rise in USCR is a concern that needs to be you know monitored as well. Yeah. Well presented, Swati. Uh, what is the, what's your explanation? Why does the urine albumin go up? So the exact reason for that is uh, not clear. Uh, some, there are some studies, animal studies have shown that some uh, uh, intrarenal hemodynamic changes are happening, some uh, systemic vasodilatation can happen uh, after sodium bicarbonate supplementation. That might be the reason. So we'll have to move on with further studies for better understanding sir, for that. What is your recommendation to reduce the pill burden? How do you do that? So we had used a, a tablet with uh, 6 milliequivalents. We should have used a tablet with uh, 12 milliequivalents, like 1 gram. That was not available in our center. That was the reason. So tell us in one, one sentence, what is the conclusion? The sodium bicarbonate is a cheap, simple, and powerful tool for a nephrologist. So if we can use it properly, uh, uh, extracting the full benefit of that, uh, then it will be uh, useful. <laughs> OK. So you are suggesting that higher dose of sodium bicarbonate should be given to all patients who have uh, low bicarbonate level, serum bicarbonate level. Is that so? Instead no. of the conventional two tablets three times daily, you are recommending three tablets uh, six hourly or whatever. Is that your recommendation no, or sir, your the, suggestion? The levels, uh, the higher levels, now the data is available till 26 milliequivalents per liter. So more than that, some observational data is available for 28 to 32. So if we can, if we are able to keep a higher level weather, if we can uh, provide more data, for a higher level, then uh, we can increase, we can maybe um, uh, professional bodies. what will be the chances of going into alkalosis, overshoot alkalosis? Yes, sir, but. Uh, with a very high dose of bicarbonate. Anyway, what is the importance of your study now? You are going to recommend to the community that uh, high, uh, you need to keep the bicarbonate level at 24 or 26, is it? In my study, in the high dose sum, we got uh, 24.7, mm. and EGFR, there was no difference. It mm. was found to be safe, but EGFR, uh, maybe because of a short-term study, there was not much of a difference. So further, uh, we would like to um, do a long-term study over six months, including the albumin creatinine ratio in the study. Hello. 
So right now, you would not make such a recommendation, right? That high dose bicarbonate should be given. Right now, we cannot. Okay. What was your involvement? Sir, I was What the did you actually do? Sir, recruitment, uh, screening of the patient, recruitment, uh, administering um, investigations, the um, BBG, all investigations, everything, and following How up the patient. How did you confirm complaints of a patient of chronic kidney disease, whether he is taking 12 tablets of, uh, of bicarbonate? It's not a very comfortable tablet to have, isn't it? Yes, sir. And 12 tablets of bicarbonate with gastric acid is going to cause a lot of belching. Yes, sir. Only one patient we could give 12 tablets. Pill burden was very, it was difficult. Okay. Now, earlier we, uh, the first uh, speaker also, the audience can have a chance to ask questions. This time for her also, one or two questions from the audience. Please, please use the mic and... Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, Sadish. No, just a suggestion. Instead of using soda backup tablets, probably you can use sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. Baking soda, 5 grams is 1 teaspoon of baking soda. And you can mix it as a powder and give it. It's 5 grams means, that means it will be around uh, 10, 11 into 5, about 55 millimoles in 1 teaspoon. It's a very high amount and probably better tolerated than a tablet, which is probably <coughs> mostly padding rather than sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate plus hydrochloric acid gives sodium carbonate and carbon dioxide. That is the most uh, important disadvantage of sodium bicarbonate. I, for one, used to prefer Shawl solution, which is sodium citrate and citric acid, but uh, somehow these days the, patient, the patients like it. Patients are very comfortable with Shawl solution and sometimes when, even when you ask them to stop it, they don't stop it. And we have had problems with that also. Yes, uh, Girish? Yeah. Did you monitor the ionized calcium and serum calcium to see whether with correction of acid, no, alkalosis are producing the lower ionized calcium and other problems associated with it? Uh, actually, we have not measured ionized calcium, sir. Total calcium was measured and uh, patients were not having any symptoms of hypocalcemia and we had excluded patients with uh, symptomatic hypocalcemia from the study. Means those who developed hypocalcemia were excluded or the patients who had pre-existing? Pre-existing hypocalcemia were excluded and patients uh, total calcium was monitored. Sir, uh, uh, last comment by Satish. No, and Christine to the first. Ah, yeah, this is a question on the first. Not for her. The the heart therapy. Surgery. Surgery. Can you can you come over? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. you are there. Fine, yeah. fine. So I just wanted to say your study there was some discrepancy in your creatinine and your EGFR. You said uh -huh. your average creatinine in your study was 3.3, .3, I think mean mm -hmm. value. But yes, you sir. said the mean GFR was 57. Now yes, GFR sir. is a derivative of creatinine, so you cannot have a different creatinine and a different GFR. 3.3 .3 creatinine cannot translate to a 57 GFR. No, it's very difficult. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, we monitored uh, creatinine every two weekly initially. And uh, uh, maybe the GFR was at the present GFR, sir, because few patients uh, who required RRT, we shifted from acute medical care. And this creatinine was after one month mainly, sir. So maybe may many values of creatinine was there, sir. In hospital I admission, mean, we had daily of, creatinine. Uh, creatinine and GFR were different time points. Uh, EGFR was at onset, sir, as presentation. And creatinine maybe, sir, later follow-up after treatment and discharge. Thank you. Sir.